I've been looking forward to this episode for quite some time. And no pressure, no pressure, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I will start by saying that I think we met only once in person, uh, roughly a month ago or so. At, at Calais. At Calais, exactly. And yeah. Hamra, we're just sort of, we bump into each other. Or I actually, yeah. no, that's not, that's not actually right. I intrude on you because you're sitting with common friends. Uh, I think it was Misha, and um, I, I guess it was Misha, and was it Sammy as well that was sitting? Sammy, Sammy Zreb, that's Sammy right. Sammy yeah. yeah, so Misha, Tobias, Sammy Zreb, and you're there, and I just sort of introduced myself. And more importantly, um, I'm a big fan of your written word, and the reason I say this is I've seen you all over the place, and it's always eloquence, whether it's yesterday on Al Jazeera English, whether it's Middle East Eye and months back, um, I guess it was The Intercept at some point. I was reading you yeah. there. That was and, uh, early 2020, I think, yeah. Right, and it's, it's all October 17 and the aftermath. And of course, The Public Source, an independent platform that I'm a big fan of. Um, there's a lot to talk about. This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatar. This is the Beirut Banyan. So before we jump into the, well, the long-term pain that you've been covering and I've been trying to reflect on in these episodes, I'm just curious as a friend, as somebody who's trying to navigate your own life here at the moment. How does it feel to cover this story in a personal way? And I ask you this because you're, you're a journalist and I read always that you're almost, um, you're not part of the story. You're covering it, you're reporting on it, but it's, all, it's a third person take. And I live in the reflexive world. My world is all about personal and emotion and intimacy. And I think you have a well-honed craft. You're delivering a story to whether it's a Lebanese audience or an international audience. But I'm wondering how you relate to that story and whether or not it takes its toll on you. Yeah, you know, it's it's very tricky. You know, I'm I, I came very late into the whole journalism thing. I always wanted to work in policy or some UN agency. That was my dream before journalism happened. And, you know, it's, it's, it's very tricky because at first, you know, I, I'm, I'm someone who's actually very opinionated and I have very strong opinions and something that was very difficult for me, um, other than developing my, my skills as a journalist, which is going to keep going for the rest of my life, obviously, was that um, there, were, there were often sort of these claims that I was just too close to the story to give nuanced reporting, uh, to not let my biases show. And, yeah, I don't know, that was, you know, something that is very weird because obviously with the Beirut blast, for example, yes, you know, I was affected, um, you know, friends and family, the economic crisis. Yes. You know, it, this is something that affects everybody differently, but it has affected people. It has affected me and people close to me. Um, so how do you do that? It's very, it look, it's very tricky, right? Um, because, you know, it, it's, it's hard to disassociate yourself from something that directly impacts you. Um, but at the same time, I figure that, you know, as a journalist, when I try to talk to folks who are impacted, I think, well, look, if I want to express myself, I have the capabilities of doing so. But my experience doesn't tell the whole story. What I really care about is, 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 is shedding light on perhaps the worst cases that exist mm -hmm. that are often ignored because they might not be the most appealing to the international media or someone who doesn't read Arabic or doesn't under, doesn't know much about the nuances of, 
our communities here in Lebanon. So for me, I just learned to completely dissociate and I just, I, over time, there's sort of like the switch that you just turn off and you say, this isn't about me right now, it's about them. And if you think of it like this, if you're talking to a friend and your friend is going through a hard time and you might have gone through the same thing, um, you don't interrupt them and say, or and throw yourself into it, right? You use that empathy if it exists, right? I, I, for example, I don't know what it's like to be a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon. I don't know what it's like to be a migrant domestic worker in Lebanon. I don't know. So I can't technically show that kind of empathy, right? I don't have that shared experience with them. But the point is, I just say, you know, this is not about me. It's about them. If it's about me, I can write in an op-ed. I can, <laughs> you know, I can, I can, or whatever. I can talk to a therapist about it or something, but um is there any equivalency there between an op-ed and therapy? Is it the same? Thing? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I try not to. I try not to make things about me anyway. Sure. I think it's just. A, I just feel like you know whatever. It's not. That's not the point. Um, so yeah, it, it is. It is. It is tricky at first, right? Because, you know, think of it like this: like you know, you're going to talk to a representative from a political party that you know has played the role in decimating your country, but you have to talk to them you know, with a straight face and listen to them and, and give them the right of reply. Um, you have to talk to uh, par political parties or businessmen who you don't agree much on with or think have done some, you know, have done some pretty awful things, but you somehow you just develop that, that switch and, just, and just, you just turn off and it's not about you, it's about them. And I think that that's what happens. And I, and I talk to many of my, my colleagues here in Lebanon and it, it's, it's something that we kind of discuss sometimes where we think, oh, you know, it's, it's so difficult to talk to somebody who's going through something horrible that you might be going through as well or that you really care about because you see it for yourself every day. Um, you know, whether it's someone who's missing in the blast or someone who lost a family member in the blast or someone who lost their entire life savings in the bank and can't afford their health insurance anymore. Right. Um, and but this is a reality. And um, this is what we have to do. This is our job. It's not about us. You know, the reason I, I started off this way is because I know that there's a there's a challenge at, at, at least trying to share someone else's story and, and pulling yourself out of it. And the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because you do it with such eloquence. And I am a big fan of your long form analysis, but it's not analysis, it's storytelling. And I, it must have been back in February. There was a, a sort of investigative piece that you wrote about the protester who was shot in Tripoli. Was it uh, Omar Taiba? Uh, That's right, Tripoli? yes. Right. So I, I remember reading that piece and thinking that not only did you take me into his home and almost like a, an hour by hour account at some point, it's minute by minute, you also, in a, in a way, you're unraveling false, false narrative. You're providing evidence to the contrary of what was offered. At least for the reasons why he was shot, and you do it with such patience that it's almost like I'm I'm getting emotional reading your take, your interpretation of someone who was shot dead, and I don't really think automatically about what it feels like for you to do that, but I'm it's I think it's a skill and you you've you've honed it quite well, Kareem. And I say this, I know I mentioned this in person when we first met, and I know I'm I'm kind of like you. I don't like compliments, but I like giving them, <laughs> so I take advantage whenever I can. <laughs> And you know what, if you don't mind, let's, let's go back in time a bit before we jump into the last few months. If you don't mind, let's start with that, actually that piece. And I found it today uh, on the public source, and I'll, I'll title it here. It's The Killing of Omar Taiba, a visual investigation of a protester's death in Tripoli. This falls under the disorder report, state repression, militarization. Now, first, I'll say that I'm, I'm happy the public source exists because otherwise I don't think this would exist. I don't think, uh, I can't imagine any mainstream outlet or traditional media persona going this deep into this killing. So chapeau to you for, for doing this and chapeau to the public source. But I'm curious how you were able to actually go through the social media content that you exposed and how were you able to actually, what was the process like really sort of showing exactly what happened and challenging the security forces, the internal security forces narrative. Is this something that came naturally to you? And did you have the sort of Facebook accounts ready? Was it something very simple? I mean, I'm curious, what is it like to be an investigative journalist at this level when it comes to one incident in Tripoli, a horrible incident, but one that you're able to dive deep into? So just, just the process itself. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, you know, first it was a, a huge team effort, you know, with the public source, with everything that we do, it, it goes through a very meticulous process between everybody and whether it's, uh, you know, the editor-in-chief, Lara Vitar, or whether it's any of my other colleagues, you know, Karim Mirhish, Christina Cavalcanti, Yara Almor, you know, uh, they, they all play such an important role um, mm. in, in doing this. And, 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 and I think without sort of that kind of high level of, of meticulousness that we have, I don't think this investigation would have happened the way it did. Right. Basically, what happened that the night he was killed, you know, um, you know, this was the first incident of a protester uh, being killed in quite some time. And I think the fact that several protesters, you know, during the October uh, uprising in late 2019, who have been killed, this, you know, we, we thought about it a lot, you know, Al Abu Fakhir and, and Attar and, and everyone else. So when that happened, I was, I think I was speaking with Lara, and I was saying, listen, let's 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 figure out what happened let's let's try and retrace you know what happened uh, this is this is very important and you know when you see cases of, of people being killed at the hands of security forces whether it's the police or otherwise you know you do see you know not in lebanon but elsewhere you do see that there are some really good investigations that try to at least trace what happened understand what happened then you know you think of i immediately thought of of, of, of Fawaz, who was uh, who was killed in tripoli um was it about a year ago this is, uh, and, yes yeah right. yeah and you know people talked about him a lot there were huge protests the next day and you know the army said they're going to investigate but that all just disappeared right so i'm thinking well we're not i mean the journalists journalists aren't judges or legal investigators but we can at least try and get the information put it out there and do the best we can with it so i immediately you know started you know to call folks who I, I i knew lived in tripoli or at the protests see if they knew anybody and it was sort of a word of mouth thing so try to get as many eyewitnesses who were in, in nur square that night which is where uh, omar taiba was shot and then i you know eventually i called the hospital um, and i and i said you know the, the omar. so it's really just yourself you're you're doing whatever you can to collect data on your terms it, it's it's really it, just yeah Exactly. Now, what I also did, of course, is that, you know, um, I looked throughout on, on social media for videos that were posted. I think there were three videos uh, that were posted that showed the shooting incident, which I tried to right. kind of put together and, and, and parallel. One of them was one of them was taken, uh, you know, by this activist in Tripoli. It was like a two hour um, uh, Facebook live um, uh, live stream. And so, you know, he took it down, but I, found, I got a hold of him and he sent it to me and I was able to sort of corroborate that with talking with um, Omar's brother, who saw him a couple yes. of hours before he passed away, and his two cousins or two relatives that were with him at the protest that night. Um, and then to corroborate all these you know, testimonies and stuff, I spoke with um, an Al Jadid correspondent who was, who was there. And, and you know, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I'm glad that in that piece, you actually you embedded a clip from Al Jadid showing, showing that there's actually bullet rounds or, or a case right. sh shells from an AK-47, or it's at least perceived to be an AK-47. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I like that you're actually able to visualize it. Literally, we're able to see what your, what your, in a way, what your data collection is mm -hmm. like. But sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, not at all. And, you know, at first I thought, let's just kind of trace it. And then the more we heard about his, his story, what it represented, and sort of the way that people were talking about it, you know, this is where one of our editors, Anya Sezadlo, who was in Lebanon for a very long time, did fantastic work as a journalist in the region, um, said, you know, we need to integrate the human element of this as well, which I think is very important. Now, Abby Sewell, uh, who's, a, who's, a, who's a fantastic journalist in Lebanon, did a great profile about Omar Taiba and his family for Lorient today. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, you know, we thought we have to also embed that sort of element into it, the human element, basically how the day was so mundane, you know, his, you know, Omar and his brother just said, you know, how's it going? What's going on? I'm going to a protest, you know, be careful, you know, and later on how, how people felt when they, when they saw what happened. And, um, you know, I got a hold of his family through basically, you know, the document, which sort of says, you know, announces his passing, the funeral is taking place. Um, and his brother's number was there. So I messaged him and his brother oh, wow. was happy That's to talk to me. And I'm sorry that I, it sounds almost well, naive to ask these questions, but I, I, I like hearing exactly how it's done. So it's really, you're just, you're gathering whatever you can and, and starting a story. That, Cause I, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the idea was just to kind of piece together what happened to get an understanding. Obviously more could be done. You know, this is, you know, 
but of course it was a very dark night. It's not like there was lots of security footage, footage or something I could access. You know, I tried to get a hold of the security forces. You know, they did respond. Um, you know, with, 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 I mean, to be fair to them, they did respond. It was a very, you know, typical kind of statement where they said, you know, we're investigating the matter and so on. But yeah, we did try to piece things together and, and say, well, what can we at least confirm from this? Um, could we at least confirm that he was a, a threat to the lives of, right. of, 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 of the soldiers or the security forces um, that were there that night? You know, um, and, and it was obvious that he wasn't, um, judging yeah. by what we got. So, Kareem, I'm, I'm going to take liberty here and quote you to you. I have the, oh, the piece okay. in front of me. Also, I'll try to do justice through my voice, but it's your words. Uh, the story of Omar Taiba suggests that ISF officers use deadly force indiscriminately against protesters who, contrary to the official narrative, posed little or no threat to the officers' lives. The public source, by closely examining television and Facebook Live footage and conducting interviews with hospital staff and six eyewitnesses, has reconstructed Omar Taiba's final hours. Our investigation found that Omar was shot in the back, most likely while trying to run away. Is this something that his brother approached you with, saying that we don't buy it? Is this something that you overheard bystanders or these eyewitnesses telling you this is not exactly what happened? Or did you find out on your own when you were watching the video footage that you were able to see that probably he was running away rather than running towards or even posing any threat? And, and I'm, I'm curious because that that's a it's a blunt assumption it's a it's a blunt assertion, mm-hmm. and you have the evidence for it, and I would assume this is the job of an <laughs> of the state or at least the ISF for that matter or anyone else to be able to do that. Yet you're the one doing it and you're piecing the puzzle. So I mean, is this a hunch or is this sort of something that's fed to you and you? It's almost like a scoop that you deliver the story as a consequence. So. You know, what we did as the public source is that we just, well, we said, well, what's available? What could we see, right? Of course, I think any case of, you know, of security forces using live ammo on protesters um, is an alarming situation. We looked at it, and this is the video from Al Jadid that was widely shared in the beginning. And it was clear that, um, that there were protesters who were throwing rocks. They were being shot at at first with a pistol. Suddenly, another officer came out with an AK-47 and started to open fire at the protesters and continued to shoot while they turned their backs and ran away. Now, we don't know for cer- we didn't know at the beginning for certain if Omar Taiba was throwing rocks, which mm. doesn't justify his killing in the first place, or whether he was um, had his back turned or not. Um, there were eyewitnesses that said he was running away. Some said they didn't see Omar until after sort of this this fiasco took place because um, there were huge crowds of people. Some people got lost in the crowd, and then. We, so we saw in social media uh, other videos that were being shared of the moment, which showed people were running away while the, sh- while the shooting was taking place from several angles. And then when we called the hospital, they said, yes, he was shot in the lower back, um, which means that, you know, he, he had his back and he, was, he wasn't confronting the police at the point he was shot. So the hospital, they, they, they said that up front, that this is they, how he they did. did. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, and, and we did speak to um, a, a protester who is also, you know, was also a paramedic uh, as well. And he briefly saw Omar before the ambulances arrived. Um, so we're able to, I so see. basically we're able to put the eyewitnesses together, uh, you know, the videos and as well to talk. So we, so we put us all together. Um, and of course, you know, this, was, this is kind of how we could have made such a, a strong assertion um, as, as the public source when we worked on this investigation. It's impressive. It's impressive reading, and it's it's a very sad story, obviously, but it's filling the gap, I think, where traditional media typically fails, and alternative media stepped in, and I think this is actually a nice way to introduce the public source. I know that you're an investigative journalist, um, and Lada Bittar is the editor in chief, if I'm not mistaken, and you you mentioned the team as well. You know, it's funny. I know Yara Al Mur from New York. Uh, she interviewed me for a project unrelated i think or maybe i don't actually know what it was for it might be for the public source i don't know but but we we've spoken we've met several times and it's a very determined team and this is born really out of frustration because october 17 the aftermath it's voices like yours and your teams that really needed to shine and you found a way to do it do you sense that this is a permanent shift in the media landscape meaning that because these crises are long-term, because political reform is 
really the issue of our lifetime, I think, at the moment, economic collapse, financial collapse, and the like, mm -hmm. socioeconomic concerns. Do you think that this is now a permanent sort of piece when it comes to the media landscape? That there's not going to be a sort of winding down of these types of outlets, that they're actually here to stay and, and they're they seem to be sustainable as well. We don't need to get into the monetization stuff. That's maybe something that's bigger or even how to, how to raise money to begin with because that's a different challenge and it's very difficult. But just the, that there's an audience and it seems to continuously expand and it's really because traditional media failed at doing the work that you're doing. Yeah, obviously I think there's still a long way to go for... Um alternative media in Lebanon or independent media in Lebanon, which is, I guess it's a very broad thing to say independent, but yeah, I mean, setting aside the challenge of monetization and the need of innovative uh, sustainability, uh, business sustainability practices, um, it, it is clear that there's an interest in, in alternative media more than before. And I think that that's for several reasons, right? I think, I mean, I think traditional media is still pretty dominant in Lebanon. It's, it's, it's a bit more accessible, it's, it's familiarity, it's people's political tastes as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, have, you know, we have to be honest that it's not that 99% of the country no longer supports the, the, the oligarchy at all. Um, but with independent media, I think what it does is that it does several things, right? It, the first thing it does is that it includes voices that are often excluded from the traditional media. Uh, these are voices that might have opinions that do not frame the political or corporate interests of the existing traditional media. This might be voices of people that are marginalized socially and legally and politically in Lebanon, that they're not welcome anywhere. Um, so something that I'm very proud that the public source has done is that we had a, a, a former migrant worker, Banji Emir from Enya Lenya, write about how migrant workers are struggling from the economic crisis from her own voice and the voice, voices of, her, of, of, of people from her, from her community. Um, you know, so I think that's one thing. And as, as well, there's certain subject matters that, that, is not, that are not necessarily welcome. And we see this how uh, in the op-ed sections of different publications. And um, I think, um, so in addition to these kinds of voices and topics, I also think there's just certain subject matters that can't be done without having an independence from the, the, the existing mm. oligarchy. There are some fantastic journalists in traditional media, people have so much respect for and have done fantastic work, but there will always be limitations on the subjects they can cover. There are some fantastic investigations that touch on the corruption uh, and other sort of malicious financial behaviors of other parties, um, but they have limitations on which parties they can investigate or, mm. or can expose, right? Yeah. Um, so I think the nice thing about independent media organizations for the most part is that they work with an equal playing field. What matters to them is, 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 is talking about these very important issues. And oftentimes what they're doing is that they see journalism, uh, at least we do at the public source that I'm sure the others do, is that we see it as something that serves the community, which means that what our, what, what, what our readers care about and what are pressing problems are the ones that we need to talk about, not the problems that we need to that we want to project based on you know our, our owners, right? And it's a very complicated kind of relationship to have, I think. Um, but it's one I think that is ought to be the basis of, of, of the publication. The publication, journalism, and publications, um, you know, technically are 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 a public service, right? You are giving people information about the authorities that they live under, that they vote for, that they pay tax money to, right? It's about their livelihoods and their well-beings and it's about their rights and their dignity, right? And so if we don't serve that uh, as, as, as journalists, then what are we, who are we serving? And what are we serving? And this is why the public source, we say that we're a publication that, that produces journalism, the public interest, uh, and that we try to be very close to the communities we cover. It's a very difficult thing to do in Lebanon, especially with the Beirut bubble that we live in. But it's very good. I'm very good, good that we and other independent publications are trying to, you know, reach out to folks, um, you know, outside. And hopefully we can become more accessible and we could uh, successfully target readers from, from, from across the country. And I think this is a challenge that everybody is taking on um, at this point. I'm glad you said marginalization and even offering that, that great piece. I'm going to actually embed it to the episode because it's, it's, I don't think it's ever been done in Lebanon maybe the only time that you had a you had somebody from a marginalized community who would have no access to any publication and you're able to make that happen 
But is that something that's born out of October 17 in particular, that you had marginalized groups sort of at the forefront, whether it's refugees, whether it's, it's any community that was not necessarily welcome earlier that took part in that massive uprising. Is that what the core message is, is that these voices need to keep going, that we need to sort of offer them a continued platform? Because I'm trying to get at what, what exactly made the public source happen. And mm. I, I remember it was something born on Twitter from my brief memory of just a few days of announcing that the public source will happen. And then suddenly it was there, almost seemed very quick and sudden. In my mind, it links back to October 17, but am I getting that right? That that's sort of the essence of, of what you're doing? Yeah, actually, I mean, the public source was something that we were working on well before the oh, uh, October uprising. So I see. in early, yeah, so we were talking about this for a while, about developing something that's very investigation heavy, very long form. Um, and we were very inspired, especially in early 2019, by the fact that it looked like Lebanon was heading towards an economic crisis. And right. we thought, well, this, <laughs> this is, uh, we were unfortunately right. But basically we said, there, there are a lot of structural problems taking place in Lebanon that need to be sort of uncovered. And this could be a very decisive year. This is when, uh, you know, Prime Minister Saad al-Harid was talking about austerity measures. Yes, it yes. was um, a little less than a year after the whole said the reforms. And we said, well, what's, right. what's going to happen? It's very interesting, you know, and, and so we want to look into structural issues. And of course, you know, we were, you know, we spent a lot of time. Uh, and this is something that I think Lara is basically a, a genius is developing the infrastructure of this media organization very slowly, you know. Um, and uh, we were working on a couple of investigations that was related to waste management and other things. Suddenly the October uh, uprising happened and we were just shocked. We didn't know what to do and things kept going on. And I think a month after the uprising started, um, we said, well, we need to kind of start in a way that responds to it. Mm, and, this is, and this is why the, the first series of pieces were, were more op-eds and essays and analysis. And we right. called it the, the, you know, basically we called it dispatches from the October revolution. And these were basically um, stories and experiences from a wide variety of people, whether it's people who um, I mean, we're not necessarily welcomed very much or included in the, in, in the uprising, whether it's, you know, necessarily migrant workers or refugees who were not necessarily welcome or included, right? Mm. Um, you know, or whether it's, for example, talking about issues that had been discussed um, or, or, or seen as coping mechanisms. So, that, for example, we had Ayman Makarim write a two-part piece about mutual aid. Right. And this, is, this came around the time where we start to really feel the pain of the, uh, of the Lira crisis when it no longer was at 1,500 to the dollar. And you started seeing, you know, lots of, um, you know, fundraisers and char charitable efforts for folks in the winter, you know, who needed medicine, um, uh, you know, money to pay for their uh, generators for the heat heating, these kinds of things. Um, and so, so Ayman was, you know, want to write about mutual aid, which was an alternative form, uh, alternative to charity. Right. Um, yeah. So that's kind of what 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 what, what served that purpose. You know, we had Ramiz Daghir, for example, who has been quiet for a while, but he had a he has a fantastic political blog called Mullah Hazat, and you know he's you know he's a he's a doc, he's a doctor, but yes. also a political nerd. And we had him talk a lot about how you know he was actually he's a he's a psychiatrist, I believe, who basically talked about how the media tried to skew certain things about the uprising, uh, which sort of merged his you know his love of psychology with with politics and. Uh, this, this is someone, for example, who would not probably make the traditional media because he doesn't have a PhD in, in comparative politics and uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't have uh, the ego of some of the people that we see on television these days, right? So I like I that. That was such a diplomatic attack <laughs> against anyone with a PhD in comparative politics. Well done, Kareem. That was so, oh. that was so well, like caressed and, and delicately served, you know? <laughs> you know, it's... Not all PhDs with comparative politics, uh, but you know, it's, yeah. it's what it is. <laughs> right, exactly. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but I, I mean, and I, I know that, I mean, it's unfair for me to ask you maybe huge questions on the public source since that maybe is better asked to Lada Bitar. So I, I'd like to ask you, and you can say as much as you'd like, and if you think it's better asked to Lada, you just let me know. I, I, I think 
well, I'll, I'll say the first thing is that I'm, I'm lucky that uh, someone like me who can maybe misstep on Twitter and say something that's a bit aggressive and calling a piece that Lara wrote recently, quote, mediocre, but then being able to reach out to her and, and you and, and t talk it through. And she was even very generous. She offered me the chance to write a letter to the editor as well. This mm -hmm. level of professionalism, I think is so outstanding. I, I, felt, a, I felt a bit embarrassed actually. So I, it was an honor and also a sort of a bit of humiliation. It's like, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> but I, I didn't ever read the, uh, the, maybe the mission or the, even the about section for the public source until today. I associated with names rather than there being an actual message. Mm. And I'm going to read it out loud and I just want to pick your brain on this and you can say as much as you'd like. Sure. So this is in the, on the website. The public source is a Beirut-based independent media organization. It is dedicated to reporting on socioeconomic and environmental crises afflicting Lebanon since the onset of neoliberal governance, governance in the 90s and providing political commentary on events unfolding since October 17. We write deeply and critically on vital issues from local perspectives, both in the moment and after the dust has settled in the service of public interest. In my mind, it is a deliberate focus on economics and economics first rather than politics even though politics is an extension and that sort of it's set up front that these are structural problems going back to the 1990s neoliberalism and the like is that a decision taken to perhaps avoid what is the usual give and take and that's the give and take that i had on twitter whether it's issues that are very sensitive like Hezbollah uh, or geopolitics that are sort of always screamed and shout and they're all over the place, whether it's online or even more so on mainstream media, shouting matches. Uh -huh. And they tend to be battles online rather than productive uh, conversations or for that matter, journalism. Is there, is there any decision taken there to sort of let's leave that outside or is it, am I seeing it wrong perhaps that it's just focusing on one thing but not necessarily letting the other ones slip and, and get away from the story? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, perspective on things. I think, look, with the, with the economics component, it was, it was, you know, at the time we were looking at, we saw a gap in the coverage of the structural issues and we wanted to, to take that on. At the same time, um, we're not trying to avoid any, any subject matter, mm -hmm. any sort mm -hmm. of issue that we see vital. We will take it on if we have the capacity and the ability to do so, right? We want to produce good quality journalism. If there's a story that's interesting, but I can't get the right kind of information uh, and, I can't get the, and I can't do the story right, then I can't do it. We will try and find a freelancer to do it, but it's about producing the best journalism we can. Uh, we don't want to avoid anything. And for us, we see the economic issues of political one, right? At the end of the day, right. yeah. there are decision makers um, in, in, in government uh, uh, that, that, you know, that, that lay out these economic policies. You know, the fact that we don't have any sort of viable social protections for people is a political decision. It's a law. Um, you know, it, it comes in laws and decrees and, and legislative frameworks. You know, the fact that we take certain, every decision that's taken by this Lebanese state is a political move, right? Because it's, it's, it's done by ministers, it's by parliamentarians, by, uh, by other authorities, right? So uh, for us, we don't see it as a separation uh, from, from political issues, uh, for sure. Of course, at the public source, we all share very similar values. We have our differences, um, but we all have a very similar uh, backbone when it comes to these things but of course you welcome um you know diversity of thought this is who we are um but of course you know we're our only exceptions are you know you can't be a, a xenophobic sexist overall terrible fascistic kind of person right but like <laughs> you know in but but you know but but on that note uh we you know we we are open to any kind of um any kind of material if we have the capacity and the ability to do it right but i like that you said it's you see the politics through economics and that they're it's almost they're, they're married issues you can't really extract them from one another is there any nuance in that conversation Me meaning that if you're going back three decades is it is it equally and i'm really asking this from, from your own opinion your so your own take on this right that it's not just a domestic story that mm -hmm. lebanon is plagued by geopolitics too and, and that doesn't necessarily have an economics component per se. That that's, if it has economics component, it's collateral. 
rather than anything. And it's sort of long-term uh, damage, but that there, is a, there are other factors at play. So I'll, I'll just throw out a, a stupid example. Um, it's not just Hadidiism. It's not just uh, the 1990s crony capitalism that, that dates back earlier than 1990s. It's oh. not just Solidaire. It's not just that kind of uh, rampant type of capitalism that I think is best defined as neoliberalism, even though I don't know the actual meaning for that word, but I assume that it's born out of that kind of reckless economics that hurts everyone. And then that aside, there is a geopolitical nightmare that Lebanon is a part of. Is that, is that a fair way of looking at it or do you see it as one is perhaps more essential? I mean, speaking for myself, I think that, no, I mean, both are, are linked with each other. You know, mm. we live in a, in a globalized world. Lebanon is a very small country where lots of other, other countries are, inter are interested in intervening politically and, 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 and elsewhere. Mm. Um, you know, to talk about Lebanon's crises, excluding the role of international states in any kind of issue, whether it's security related issues, it's an economic related issue. I mean, you know, if it's about, if it's about Iran, Hezbollah, sure, that's one part of the story as well, mm. because mm. at the same time, I mean, you look at the international community, which have taken a much more stern position on Lebanon, you know, no government, no loans and aid to redevelop your economy, right. yes. but they've been giving so much money to Lebanon for decades now. And it was after people protested that they took a, a firmer, a firmer stand. So right. to rule out any international role in Lebanon's crises is ruling out an important part of the story. The question is, you know, identifying who did what, their impact, but, and also identifying the role that we play as journalists, um, and also identifying the gap that exists in the media landscape. Right, um, right. And I think for us at the public source, we really want, looked, wanted to look into very deep local journalism, local journalists that might be unappealing for international media who think it's just far too local but would be very interest, interested, uh, considered very interesting for the local audience, where we look into, for example, how institutions are run, how they're managed, right. nefarious financial practices, all these things. Um, but it's not that we're disassociating the economic crisis from the political or the geopolitical. It, it's, it's just that we, we saw a gap that we wanted to fill. And we thought, well, what is the best thing that we can do? And, and that was kind of, uh, kind of that. But we're not, we're not excluding the geopolitical at all. No, but I appreciate that emphasis on the gap. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, my, my, uh, <laughs> my, my footprint is much smaller than the public source. Or, and in terms of just having an audience that's willing to tune in, podcasting is still relatively new on the Lebanese scene. Although it's almost the last few months, everyone has a podcast now or thinks they have a podcast. So that's, it's become very catchy. But, but I also see this as filling a gap too that you can have sensitive discussions without interruption in this uh, medium. And a mutual friend of ours, Jad Ghassan, I think was my best conversation I've had mm. on all things Lebanon. I think uh, 90 minutes, no interruption, the most sensitive of issues, mm -hmm. done very diplomatically, no one lost their cool. And almost made me wonder, you know, this if this is something that can be done at this level of... Uh, what is usually tension and, and anger, I think it's perhaps the way forward that TV can't do it. Mainstream media doesn't do it well. And I, the, the gap, that sort of big gap, is that something that, do you think it's the responsibility of mainstream media to catch up with the times? And the reason I'm asking it in reverse is because mm. I just spoke to Albert Costanian. He was the last episode, last guest on, on the podcast. Mm. He seems like a podcaster on TV, <laughs> or he's trying to do what we, what I do on, on, on a massive sort of outlet on LBC. Do you think that it's their job to sort of do better? Or do you think it's almost like, let them fade into the sunset if they're not doing their job, even if their audience is big, at some point the attention will come towards independent and alternative media. It's almost mm. like that survivability of mainstream media and projecting into the future, whether this is the way to do it. 
And it's a huge question, but as much as you'd like to say on really what's what's happening in terms of this sort of this terrain filling the gap and the usual suspects that we see. Yeah, I, I think Alberto Sanyan's show, and I think you know with with Mark Dow's new show on Al Jadid, yes. Al Jadid, which is yes. uh, which I think is interesting. I think that they complement each other in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this is very podcast like, right? If right. if you just rem if you just listen to it, it would be a very interesting podcast, um, and it's definitely a new take on talk shows. I don't think you and Jad Hosson could have had that conversation on any television station in Lebanon. Right. For two reasons. One, it was very frank. It was very honest. It was not necessarily entertaining because you guys weren't throwing chairs at each other. <laughs> right. That would have been great if we just ran to just throw a chair. <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, you would have generated a lot of good ad revenue for that. Right. But yeah. it wasn't like an, an Etijah al muakis kind of show. Right. <laughs> it, it, it was a serious conversation where you guys were exchanging these ideas. And I think they're quite important to have because they're also a reflection of some of the things we saw in the uprising as well. Mm -hmm. Especially in the first few days before you know things start to you know heat up a bit with some of the attacks that took place against protesters, yes. there were lots of heated, angry discussions between people talking about, you know, is Hezbollah part of you know killon yani killon? Right, right, right. And these are important conversations that need to be had. The, if 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 there's going to be any sort of change in Lebanon, if there's going to be actual you know form of 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 of, um, of any form, let's say. Uh, development, I'm using it in a very broad term, um, it's, it's going to be through these kinds of conversations because people here are, have been so kept away from each other. You don't even have public spaces to have these kinds of conversations. Everywhere you right. go, public parks, you have people, you know, who are, even, you know, they're trying to spread the word of a certain faith or they're having a rant about something political, whatever it is, what, no matter how obnoxious it might be, it's a conversation starter. And you always have a conversation with, with something, even if that, even that, even if it, um, it sort of just further verifies that you oppose or support something, it's a conversation. We don't have these kinds of spaces. We, we, we watch those television shows at night and they're, they're, it's more entertainment. The moment there's substance in the conversation, the moment somebody wants to elaborate, whether it's an activist, a doctor, or a member of parliament, the host jumps in and says right. something in inflammatory just, just to keep things hyped up. Because, you know, frankly, these talk shows resemble more Jerry Springer and Maury Povich than any form of actual informative conversation. I mean, let's be honest here, right? And this is where I think things were different with your conversation with Jad, or even to an extent what we see with Alberto Sanyan and now with Mark Dow's new show on Al Jadid. Um, so I think it's really important. And I think mainstream media, I mean, look, the feasibility of them sort of stepping up, is, you know, it's, it's tricky because of their, their financial backers. Of course, and yes. Interests. But should, in theory, should they? I think they should, you know. And I think that most of the people who work in these organizations do what they do because they do care about give information to people. I don't think that, you know, I don't believe that folks who work in mainstream media journalists, they, they work, you know, in bad faith. I think they might have perspectives that are sympathetic with elements of the oligarchy. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you ask them, you know, why are you a journalist? They say, well, I really care about sharing information to people. And I've had conversations with many of them and we disagree on a lot of different things, but um, they, they aren't bad people. These aren't people who, you know, played a role in decimating the economy. Um, exactly. Yeah. And then even, I mean, I think it's worth mentioning, Jad Ghassan, who was in a way born out of mainstream media, had his own show on Al-Jadid, was an investigative mm -hmm. reporter, investigative journalist. And I even remember him shining during the protests. We'd all be watching him on those big, big television screens yeah. in the middle of Martyrs Square. Someone like him can make that transition. And he's he's mm. doing really well on on his own his own independent independent platform, but it's a podcast. Mm -hmm. He's not doing a TV show. He's not trying to make it uh, sexy in any way. It's it's long form conversation, and it works. Mm. And I really I admire that that capability of either trying to bring this to mainstream TV, or if you're booted out, or if you quit, you take it to independent media. And I really think what you said is so accurate. I never thought of it that way. This is public space that's been robbed, except it's through dialogue and now it's over Zoom, but it's, it's, that's, that's how you build it. And that's in a way, it's both comforting and it's persuasive and it's mm. civil. And I like the way you framed it. 
Um, I won't take too much more of your time, Kenny. I've already sort of taken more than I than I promised. But um, I, I want to jump a bit into your most recent piece, which was in Al Jazeera English, it was released yesterday, actually. And it's in my my readings of your articles. This seems to be among the bleakest articles I've read because it is so so depressing and so pessimistic. But before we get into that, I'll title it here. It's little hope left. Lebanon's paralysis and a collapsing state. And the byline is international community fails to speed up government formation in Lebanon, even with the economy in meltdown. The reason I say it's it's bleak and, and, and negative is because you, you, in a way, summarized the last year and a half in one article, and it's every step that was taken that was wrong, every, uh, every misstep or every, every, every opportunity that was missed, and now we're in what seems to be experiencing the political suicide of the political class. And there's a quote, I'm going to quote you to you here. It may just be political suicide for Lebanon's ruling parties that dominated the political and economic landscape over the past few decades, which no notably includes public sector hiring and private contracting in exchange for political loyalty. When you said loyalty there, that's the one word that I don't usually read in these kinds of reflections, that it's not just about corruption or about even um, mediocrity or usual politics. And you started off by discussing discussing Aoun and Hadidi, unable to get that list right. There's loyalty. And there's also the political class unable to take that the way they do usually, and just sort of prolong the status quo. Mm -hmm. And his name escapes me now, but there was an LAU professor who described it in the article. Mm. I wish I remembered his name now. Uh, Dr. Bassa Salouk. There we go, Bassa Salouk, yeah, who says that it's impossible to reform this uh, system, but you can just prolong it. And, and somehow we've reached the end where you cannot prolong it. But suicide and loyalty and sort of the us stuck in between. Is this a fait accompli that we're all going to sort of not die in this sinking ship and not all disappear, but more that it is impossible at this stage to reform the system? that you have to somehow end it. And that requires a major overhaul that has not happened. And that's something that's maybe beyond the protest movement's capabilities. And it's not something the political class is interested in, but it's a, um, we've reached the end. And I, I, I'm sorry to sound so damn negative here, but I really read it as uh, I'm going to sort of jump off the balcony right now. <laughs> Well, <laughs> first of all, disclaimer, I didn't say very little hope. That was the UN's office in a statement to me. So that- Right, so, it's in quotes, so, yes. It's in yes. quotes, yeah. And, and it says, um, you know, it was basically a statement that they sent me and in the end they said, you know, very little hope is left for the population given the current circumstances that we're in. Um, yeah, I, I loved um, uh, Salouk's take on the situation because, you know, we're not the country that's, that hasn't dealt with political paralysis before. You know, we've been for we've gone without a president for a long time, over two years, I think. Right. Um, yes. You know, before President Aoun came to power in late 2016. Yes. Um, but of course, what's interesting is what's happening now, considering the position that we're in as a country. Right? Our econo our economy, which has always been fragile, is 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 not viable at all. We, you know, the country theoretically needs a cash injection. You have billions of dollars stacked up to revitalize the economy, build, the, you know, everything, all these things on the condition that they create a government that does a certain amount of reforms. And whether what we agree about the reforms is, is something else, right? It's, it's a wide range of economic and structural reforms. But the point is, is that you would think that in theory, you have a government, you have political parties, they have ruled the country, they have a lot of people on their side, just enough, same power. And the international community said, look, we're going to give you all this money. And just form a government, you know, do a financial audit, work on your accountability measures, you know, restructure your economy to make it functional again. And suddenly it becomes this very difficult and controversial thing to do. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, it's because, you know, and I, and I do trust Salouk's argument very much is that the sectarian system, the power sharing system in particular within the sectarian system, 
um, is not compatible with reforms because, right. of course, the political parties have lots of, of capital through their businesses, through their international support, uh, diaspora, otherwise. But they also play a role by through 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 the state itself by taking advantage of public of the public sector, uh, whether it's contracting private companies that they benefit from with inflated contracts, whether it's um, it's hiring at inflated rates in exchange for loyalty. Even people aren't necessarily partisans to these parties are sort of trapped because for some people exactly. they have to vote for these parties because otherwise they won't have a job. They might not be able to pay out pay a certain debt or they yeah. might, not, might not be able to afford a, a life-saving operation because they can't afford private insurance. You know, it's not a malicious loyalty. It's almost a, uh, it's a survivability mode as opposed to, yeah, or I, I mean, because I, I like that you chose that word. That it's uh, the there there are people that are loyal to ne- ir- irreformable actors, and it's something that they're accustomed to, and it's how the system is operated. So it's almost like everything lines up, but then it reaches a wall. And I like I like that you're adding that. I mean, it's it's suicidal of the political class to reach this stage. Yeah, I mean, I mean, think of it like this, right? If you if you do a financial audit of the central bank, bank and state accounts, you're going to expose a lot of people, right? Right. If you yes. decide to invest in, you know, universal healthcare, strong public education, and a proper taxation system, suddenly there's less of a need for people to, to ask political parties to pay off college tuition or life-saving operations. So right. that weakens your clientelistic network, and the clientelistic network, as uh, now MP Taimur Jamblat said to Al Jazeera in 2018. It's like a family business. Yes, I remember and, that quote. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, so, 20, was it 2018? Yes, it was before the protest. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Right, right before the elections, right. And so mm. here's the thing. So you have these political parties that have their private businesses that always get state contracts that are funded um, by international loans or, or, or to a certain extent, you know, tax money. And then you also have a clientelistic network, which they win because which they profit off from in the sense that they, they go back into power you know, I don't think Walmart would ever deliberately put itself out of business, you know? So this is, this is kind of the situation that we're in. But I think it's interesting because at least, I mean, I'm, I'm relatively young, but I don't think we've seen the country this paralyzed in these circumstances before. You look at any country that is, is, is unable to pay its debts. It has a poverty rate exceeding 50%. It's currency devalued by over 85% in, uh, in less than two years, you would think that everybody, everybody would just jetpack out and just say, oh, we just really messed everything up. But people are still clinging to power because the question is which political party is willing to own up to its mistakes. And, uh, but nobody is, even though I, they've all played the role in this, right? But um, it is an interesting, um, as, as, as my colleague Lara says, it's very, we're, at, we're at a very interesting critical juncture in our, in our history. But I, I'm going to ask you a huge question to wrap it up and it's uh it's just trying to project a bit down the road if from your investigative reporting from your from your general reporting your your own reflections and having covered this issue for for quite some time now do you see things getting worse in the near term and i mean that in terms of paralysis becoming near permanent economic collapse furthering the despair, populations, pain and agony, and even a level of unrest that has sometimes emerged where you could have forms of anarchy even, and violence, low level violence, not civil war, not 1970s and 80s, more that uh, becomes ungovernable. And do you see that on the horizon? And I, I've, I asked a similar question to Albert and he approached it from the most optimistic viewpoint, he said, Long-term, things will get better. It's hard for me to see that, but that you project long-term, yes, the foundation is being built now. And is that, do you sense that? At least in your limited time on planet Earth, you said you're young from your own. Rel- <laughs> relatively young. Relatively <laughs> young, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I think long-term, obviously, things eventually have to turn around. Um, but I, I do think these concerns are valid. I don't think that there's going to be a civil war. I don't mm-hmm. think so. I don't think anyone's in, it's not in anybody's interest, not, not the, not the Lebanese forces, not Hezbollah. I don't think they want that at all. Um, 
because I think one of the biggest things that people are concerned about right now is their personal security. They see what's happening in Palestine, see Syria, they see Iraq. They're, they don't want it to happen again, you know. Um, um, and this is why, you know, at, at, at some point, some people felt a bit hesitant about a political revolution. They said, well, what if this leads to stability, mm-hmm. war? And we can't go through this again. And it's understandable. Um, now, um, when it comes to things getting worse, I mean, have we seen the worst of things yet? We haven't, no. And yeah. it's, it's unfortunate. And we are seeing in certain spaces the... Militarization implies that there's going to be a war, but I guess let's say a more aggressive rhetoric, a more militant rhetoric from different political parties when it comes to the cer- certain circumstances that we're in. Um, and you can see that there's lots of pent up anger, which is going to be used in the, in the wrong kind of places. Right. For example, it's a very small example, but it's an example nonetheless. You know, last uh, last week when Syrians and Lebanon went to the embassy to take part in, you know, the yes. sham elections. Yes. Um, Syrians were beaten sh- up. Sham elections, not Damascus. Sh- sham. No, okay. sham. As in, it was a sham, not sham as in Damascus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well. <that's>, well. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, um, it's really funny to actually. The, the, everybody who's rejected the elections, like a wide variety of states, I've been calling it a sham election. I just found it quite ironic. Um, but <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the fact that a lot of people took out their anger on, on, on Syrians on their way to the elections, I mean, it really says a lot. And I think a big trend we see everywhere that when there's a sense of helplessness among people who are suffering politically, economically or whatever from, from, from ruling classes, they're going to take it out on, on people who are vulnerable, but who are just not their kind. So their justification of beating up these Syrians uh, many of them who, according to local human rights groups, as I said, have been intimidated or even forced, uh, you know, to vote. Um, to them, it's seen as, yeah, we're taking out our anger on, on what the Syrians did to us throughout the 1990s and early 2000s. We're taking it out on, on, on the refugee crisis and, and, and what it's done to our economy. We're taking it out on job competition. So suddenly they fuel it this way because this is some sort of physical outlet yeah. they have. Right. Um, you know, you're seeing lots of people now focusing on, you know, basically internal political squabbles as sort of the root of the problem and taking it away from the, the, the wider issue. Suddenly, there's some conversations that you're kind of seeing where people focus on the issues of one party. Oh, your party had this ministry for 10 years and you wasted, you know, a billion dollars. Right. Look what you guys did. And then, well, well, you guys also stole a billion dollars, too. Right. So it's 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 one of these things. And I think it's a sign that of, of power, power, uh, powerlessness and, and 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 hopelessness. And honestly, I, I it's it's not surprising. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very tricky situation. And I don't want to sort of be that person that, you know, foreshadows things. You know, I'm not a Michel Hayek. I'm not, a, <laughs> you know, but but, you know, it's. Unfortunately, the way things are developing, we reached a point right now where I think we cannot address individual issues on their own anymore. It has to be some part of a, a restruction, a reconstruction of, again, another word with so many uh, <laughs> connotations, but a, a reformation of, 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 of how Lebanon functions, right? Because you can't just, for example, you know, do an audit and move on. You can't just right. reform one sector and move on. And the question is, are the people that have the ultimate that have the ultimate say um, uh, and influence and power are they interested in long-term sustainable economic planning that puts the interests of the most vulnerable people at heart? History tells us no, but yes. what's going to happen going forward? We don't know because we we don't I don't think we've seen the government in such a, a vulnerable position. Um, so yeah, I, I think Lara's quote is accurate. It's that critical juncture. juncture. And, um, you know, it's it's always a treat to read your written word, Kareem. Um, I feel privileged to pick your brain and hear your thoughts. Um, this hour went by really quickly, and I, I really enjoy wow. your perspective. And I appreciate what you're doing, whether it's your own reporting, Al Jazeera, Middle East Eye, or anywhere, investigative journalism in the public source and really the independent platform that you and Lada and your team put together. So I'm, I'm glad I saw it recently that you're accepting donations as well. It's not just the NGO world or these sort of foundations pumping money 
people can donate. So I'm going to embed that as well in the episode. I really appreciate your time, Kareem. And uh, I think the next time we speak, if we do a follow-up episode, we should both always be color coding and uh, we'll choose the color next time. We came really (laughs) dark and gloomy this round, but maybe next time we'll show up with something a bit brighter. (laughs) I'll wear a bright shirt, you know, yeah or something like that yeah something so, ne- neon will will glow and, and glare together <laughs> and yeah. i also had something rare occasion electricity didn't, didn't go out no the, it's amazing yeah so i'm not going to jinx it we'll end it here thank you karim thank you Ronnie. thanks for listening and watching and a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box. Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.